the Norman Foster Foundation Robotics Public Debate is now starting. Please welcome on stage the Chair of the Debate, Tim Stoner. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to those of you here in the room. Welcome to those of you joining online to this important and, as I think you will hear, urgent discussion, debate about robotics, about a future that is already affecting us now. My name is Tim Stoner. I'm an architect. I'm an urban planner. And I use technology to predict human behavior in buildings and cities. And I'm going to be joined today by three presenters that you will see have very different approaches, very different impressions about the importance of robotics. We have an art historian and critic, an engineer, and a writer and activist. And they will join me after their presentations in a discussion about the multiple dimensions of the subject of robotics. Let me start by thanking our sponsor and supporter, the Rolex Foundation, for making this event possible today, and also for supporting the week-long workshop that has been taking place in the Norman Foster Foundation. To join me on stage to give a brief summary of that workshop is Fabio Gramazio, who was this week's mentor. Fabio, the stage is yours. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. My role here is, uh, although it's uh, sort of abstract and rather difficult, is to give you an insight in, uh, in what you have been doing now for five days with uh, 10 scholars uh, coming from 10 different countries, having uh, different backgrounds, so architects, computer scientists, roboticists, mechanical engineers. Uh, the topic, or let's say the, the conceptual umbrella, has been how can we produce form, complex form, very, very efficiently. And uh, in order to do this, uh, to explore this question, because we think that uh, uh, complex form and easily produce complex forms of, without any production of waste is a major challenge if you want it to be sustainable and produce sustainable architecture, efficient architecture. To explore this question, we provided a setup you see here. So a robot that didn't reach any point in a given space that has a tool, in this case, it's a sand deposition tool, uh, and the box, and the box is the playground where uh, the scholars were investigating for a week. Now, this is just one of the three processes. I cannot comment on the, 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 the processes themselves, but I think this will be very well documented. It has been exciting. This morning, uh, we had a final review to discuss these three approaches to the efficient production of form that were generated by creative people just in two and a half days, because the other two and a half days were occupied by very important uh, uh, intellectual input. Uh, <clears throat> said that, I would uh, leave you with this atmospheric images showing that the interaction between, that show that the interaction between the human, uh, the machine, <coughs> and the material can be very complex and sophisticated and lead to uh, uh, surprising results, aesthetically surprising result, uh, structurally uh, inter interesting result, and so on and so forth. And I would uh, just conclude by uh, thanking to everybody that made this possible, to, to, to my team from Zurich that has been tutoring this, to the scholars that have engaged with this uh, non -si not simple 
uh, 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 question that we said in the beginning to the Norman Foster Foundation team that has organized this in, a, in an amazing way. You know, this is very important. If you want to produce fast, then everything has to be uh, set up nicely. And last but not least, to uh, Norman, Lord Norman Foster, uh, for giving this incredible uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, setup uh, where these ateliers take place. And last but not least, last, last but not least, to the Rolex Institute that had made this all possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you very much. Uh, we've just left the foundation. We've just left the presentations of the scholars. It was a superb event. It was, it was deep and thoughtful and creative. And it gave me the sense of the craft of the robot rather than the alien machine, the very humanistic uh, embodiment of imagination. This is something that I think our next speaker, Anne Faucheret, will speak more about. She's an, uh, an art historian, an art critic, uh, whose work explores the relationship between the human, the human body, and the machine, and sometimes the intimate relationship between the two. Anne, please come and join us. Thank you. After you. Bon chance. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to take part to this uh, public uh, debate on the very important topic that is robotics. So thank you very much for having me here. Thank you to the wonderful team of Norman Foster Foundation. And thanks you uh, especially, sir and lady Foster. A truly joyous machine. <clears throat> By joyous, I mean free. Robots have populated art, literature, and the imaginary of humankind from Iliad featuring Hephaestus automatons to Indian Lokapanati legend with its robots protecting Buddha's relics. Robots were always a great prison through which artists and thinkers approached the relations between humans and technology, between individual and system, and above all, between humans and the other. With the other, I mean the other inside the human, the mechanical self, uncontrolled and unconscious self, as well as the other outside the human, namely animals, nature, and the ones excluded because of their alterity, that is, colonialized people, ostracized people, and sadly, women. So, who is the other? That is, of course, a fundamental question in times of seamless merging between human bodies and technology, but also in times of racist and misogynist fallback positions. Located at a certain distance from the world of production, consumption, and power, art can be a laboratory where emotions, affects, fantasies, desires, but also knowledge, ethics, and political imagination are dealt with through images language, and sounds. Most artists, by using artificial intelligence and robots in their works, criticize the instrumentalization of technology for capitalist logics, that is for rationalizing, commodificating, and profit-making. Czech writer Karel Čapek offered already such a critique in 1920 in his theater piece featuring robots slave finally rebelling and eradicating humanity. The dystopic theater play was made even more terrifying with the backdrops of artist Friedrich Kisler. German artist Hito Steyerl uses Siri to address uneasy questions about war drones and about data colonization. American artist Sean Maximo shows sceneries where robots are creating green technologies on an assembly line apparently indulging in the dream of a fluid and smooth world where all chipped and intelligent objects would operate without a controlling human agent. What we see are over-monitored landscapes where only automated behaviors seem to be possible. This will be our future, future if we do not change our way to see technology. With their striking images, the artist advocates the necessity of an ethical turn Intelligent technology should be used to redistribute knowledge, wealth, and hence, 
foster empowerment of the oppressed. Intelligent technology should be used respecting human and natural resources. And it is also necessary to unveil the black box to make technology accessible and understandable. Today, even if we are totally dependent on technology, we are still unable to first understand our devices and their connectivity, how they function, and second, to grasp, to grasp the challenges they, arrive, they arise sorry, on a philosophical level. Artists help us see that technology is a structure and technical objects are not mere tools but cultural objects. As, by, as French thinker of techniques Gilbert Simondon already stated in 1956. Technical objects shape us exactly the way we shape them. And in a time when they bypass subject altogether, we can no longer separate the active subject who gives form and meaning, who works on the machine and transforms the word from the passive or material object which is formless and senseless. The border between the human and the machine, between the subject and the object, was crossed, among others, by post-structuralists Gilles Deleuze and Félix Gattari from the 1960s onwards in their attempt to deconstruct and emancipate the self. At the beginning of the 20th century, surrealists already had this intuition with their bachelor machine and other mental machines meant to free imagination and desires between set categories. Deleuze and Gattari mainly addressed two things. First, they targeted the humanistic arrogance of placing the human at the center of earth and world history and entitling him, thanks to his rationality, to dominate over other species and over nature. Second, by emphasizing on the mechanical dimension inside us, they redefine subjectivity as something complex and ever-changing, not only based on individual choices, but also depending on the environment around us. As a consequence, human, technology, and nature are not opposed, but they belong to the same continuum of things. Techno-feminist Donna Haraway even brought it further, radically stating in 1985, we are all cyborgs. The figure of the cyborg, an embodied hybrid made of flesh and machine, a creator of social reality as well as of fiction, helped her and helps us decode the construction of science and culture and opens up speculation on a post-species and post-human and post-genre utopia. The cyborg, mining distinctions between human and animal, between organism and machine, between men and women, empties these ontological categories. Danish artist Sitzel Meineke Hansen uses in her works the avatar Eva 3.0, a 3D human model conceived for adult entertainment to question the constitution of virtual pornographic heter heteronormative body and the digital production of subjectivities. Another work, Soft Materials from 2004 by American filmmaker Daria Martin Brings up, brings up new forms of relations and proposes new rituals based on encounter, curiosity, emotion, and not mere use. Almost quaint-looking non-anthropomorphic robots make contact and dance with two naked dancers. Together, robots and humans explore their bodies and build a playful and sometimes even erotic relationship. In the course of the choreography, the machines seem to acquire a life of their own and they completely lose their threatening potential. So robots and technical beings allowed theorists and artists to revolutionize the history of thought, fully implemented in the cultural realm. Technology is not only considered a medium or a topic, but a structure to think in, to think through, and to think with. And robots are new bodies to encounter. Surely artworks don't provide any pragmatic solutions, but they make us feel and think differently. They provide imaginary models for possible relations between human and machines, and by doing so, they outline alternative futures and open up the ground for a new ethics. So embracing alterity inside and outside of us is a cultural and political condition 
for a new collaboration with technical beings and for a resistance to the brutal colonization of bodies and minds, privileging more ethical consciousness and respect towards humankind and toward other species. Last sentence, this is to me the necessary step to develop technical innovation and the economic and, economic and political structures necessary to implement it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. As you've just heard, Anne uses the artistic imagination as a means of visioning the future. Our next speaker, Inigo Lastegoregi, is an engineer already using technologies in the present, innovating as an entrepreneur between the machine and the machine in ways that he's going to demonstrate right now. The stage is yours, Inigo. Thank you very much, Tim, for the presentation. So I am a computer and scientist and engineer uh, for manufacturing. So I have um, an analytical, mechanical, and pragmatical way to see the things and the life. Okay? And what I do in my daily work is to take new technologies and apply them in, a more, in the most efficient way in the industry. And for that process, I have to understand very well which is the, uh, the maturity process of uh, the maturation process of a technology. And all new emerging technologies describe an S curve in their adoption. That uh, means that, for example, a uh, um, new technology takes a long time for the development, and somewhere in the time, uh, there is an inflection point where the technology is massively adopted, and then stacks or, or holes in, in, in uh, adoption level until a new technology arises. This happened, for example, with the CD and the streaming for internet of, of music playing. Uh, one technology killed the other and changed a sector. So, but uh, looking to the machinery, to industrial machinery, uh, um, re um, revolution in technology is not very usual or is not very frequent comparing to other technologies applied, for example, for music playing. Uh, um, an industrial machine, for example, comparing to this one, from an architectural point of view, is the same. So they are basically uh, designed with the same principles. They used Cartesian uh, points and axes to machine, a, for example, a part to, and to obtain a good or a product. They both are controlled with a computer. This one is for sure more complex and more powerful, but uh, at the end, they are controlled by electronic device. Okay, um, the thing is that this machinery has only the view of this instant. and doesn't know nothing about their, about their past, what happened with them yesterday, and what is going to, uh, to be uh, is going to happen in the near future. And uh, I have to say that also that machinery, from a point of view, from a use, uh, usability point of view, is the worst design object in the history. So, not from a functional point of view, they perform very well, but from a usability point of view, they are very complex. You go, you are in front of the uh, operator panel, you don't know where to start, you don't uh, find anything familiar. Uh, the, uh, the machine doesn't guide you how to use it. Okay, and uh, when you perform an action and something go wrong, you don't know why. You, know, you don't know what happened, the reasons, etc. And this is because the variables, and parameters that affects in a manufacturing process, like here, this is a, a turning process, it's very complex to understand by human eyes. This, uh, there is knowledge there that is not evident. And you require a lot of training, expertise, years handling, the uh, manual handling of, 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 the, of the machine. Okay. So, what I am trying to do now in, uh, uh, with, uh, with my projects is to create a, a usable machine. And what I am doing is to collect 
all the data coming from sensors, co uh, controllers, and any data source that is installed there, collect all the data on the cloud, and analyze the data that's coming from this fleet of machines. At the end, it's only a black box that I install in every machine, collect the data, analyze the data automatically, and try to extract, extract knowledge in an automatic way. This is, um, this is a change in the, in the industry because, as I mentioned before, now the machines doesn't know anything about the past. But now, collecting data, we know the history of the machine. We can create mathematical models and try to project the future. For example, if you see here the images, it's a broken tool. For example, one basic application of the system that we are building is to extend the life of the tools. Another case is to find the best parameters, for example, to time uh, a, a part. This is a blade for aeronautics, for example. To machine uh, uh, this kind of part is very complex. A lot of computation in the fabrication uh, and the development phase is needed. But if we can use the power of the data that is being generated in the machines can be useful, uh, can be used for optimize the parameters of the, for, the, for the next part. Okay, so as a conclusion, uh, um, I am asking to myself if I am creating a self-regulated machine. And as a conclusion, I end that probably the operator, the machine operator is going to change. So probably it's going to disappear. Like the driver of a car is going to disappear thanks to the autonomous car that already exists. The technology is there and the only the massive adoption is blocked by regulation, uh, esca industrial escalation, and uh, things like that. So I don't have answers, but in my opinion, the machine operator is going to mutate to something new that I don't know what it is. It is, but for sure opens many questions that we have to face in the near future. So with this question, I want to, to end my presentation and let the word to, to my colleagues. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, our third and final presenter is Jonathan Ledyard, who is a former war correspondent. He's a writer for The Economist. Um, I called him an activist earlier because he's denying it, but I think he is acting to create disruptive change uh, in Africa, among other places. And uh, he's going to give us a, a presentation about his work involving aerial technologies. Uh, Jonathan, the stage is yours. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Tim. Um, right, wow. Uh, OK. Um, I. I'm really surprised by what I wanted to talk about today because I find that I'm actually much more uh, political than I expected to be. You know? uh, so I think uh, when we get into the debate, um, I, I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of political and economic points which are quite powerful. So um, first slide. Um, I want to just make a few very simple points and really articulate them over to you. Um, the first point is the robot starts from imagination. Uh, Anna uh, mentioned this point. So 80 years ago, since uh, Isaac Asimov uh, first put down the laws of robotics in some short stories, and rather bizarrely, some of those laws still have purchase in the robotics community today. Um, uh, so we start with the robot as imagination. Um, we start with a robot as a hopeful projection of ourselves, from ourselves. Um, but I want to sort of reference where we are right now in our technology moment. 
because we're really at a critical moment. The next five or 10 years is absolutely a tipping point. Um, the, the robot, which I take to be uh, no more uh, than the uncomplaining performer of slightly different precise tasks um, in the material world, this robot right now is beginning to touch with machine intelligence, with artificial intelligence. And so we, we cannot talk about robots without talking about network effect and the arrival of distributed computing. So we can see that computing in the 1980s centralized, then we get to decentralized, then we get to uh, the future distributed computing. And robotics are going to slot into that spot. And this, I think, is a really profound point, uh, almost a, a kind of Buckminster Fuller point, that just, we, just as we've meshed our biosphere on the planet, um, so that invasive species um, of insects, plants, microbes, and so on, uh, arrive and depart here in Spain every day on, on ships and planes, so that we are about to mesh uh, our physical and digital world. And the robot is absolutely at the center of that process. Um, then the natural question is, if the robot is there for uh, precise tasks and repeating precise tasks in a more accurate way, if it becomes more hyper-competitive uh, than even a Foxconn uh, factory in Shenzhen, uh, then the question is, who will benefit? And this is where I get slightly political. Um, because if we spin back our globe just a few cycles to the arrival of social media, uh, we see how pathetic, how limited the response of our political class was to the arrival of social media. And, and they did not take it seriously. Uh, obviously, people remember Mark Zuckerberg appearing in front of the United States Senate, which was frankly embarrassing um, uh, on behalf of American democracy. Um, now we're quite overcome uh, by uh, social media platforms. Uh, they uh, occupy huge swathes of brain time, um, and they, they manipulate that brain time, and they profit from it. Um, so my question is, uh, what are we going to think about robotics in this context. And in particular, I want to reference what is happening in poorer parts of the planet and what will be their position in, in this future robotics revolution. Um, uh, as Tim mentioned, I've been working um, in Africa and emerging econom economies for the last 20 years. So we ask, who will benefit? We can say that capital will benefit. Labor will not benefit. And why? Uh, because in Africa, and we can also talk about Afghanistan or Paraguay or pretty much any poor town in Galicia, um, they're not going to have access to expensive robots. And let's just do a, a quick reality check on where we are. This is, a, this is a lab in West Africa. This is a cheap 3D printer. Somebody has to buy that machine. Somebody has to maintain it. Someone has to train up uh, these uh, workers to use it. This is highly problematic. And any of you who know about uh, health systems in the African context know that x-ray machines are not available. And it's highly unlikely uh, that uh, robots will be available in the embodied romantic sense that we've been talking about so far. So, um, Obviously, the population of Africa is going to double in your lifetime. Um, unemployment will remain high. I'm really interested when you talk about distributed manufacturing uh, with robots. What, what are we going to be talking about? I, I'm really interested in a guy like this. This is what we say in Swahili, juakali, which means literally work under the hot sun. And this is the informal sector, which dominates everything in Africa. This guy is just repairing lawnmowers. That's all he does. But imagine in 20 years' time, if we could have a robotic widget, which was, you know, $20, $30. 
what would happen to his lawnmower? That's a really interesting thought. So that's the level of robotics. Is what I might say partial robotics, like a little bit of robot and a lot of uh, low technology. Norman, I mentioned there was a surprise. This is a surprise for you. Um, I remember a few years ago, uh, you told me about this project. The, this is the Olsen Amenities Building in the East End of London, the Millwall Dock. And actually, rather embarrassingly, this was done the year that I was born. Um, uh, this, I find this absolutely fascinating um, because on the one hand, we have a true kind of foster vision here. Glass walls, white collar workers, blue collar workers, they're mixing and so on and so forth. But over here, um, we see that the Olsen shipping line, which was state of the art in its day, was loading these ships with forklift trucks uh, in a very meticulous way, uh, which obviously was kind of efficient. But what I find fascinating is, Norman, you are the most prescient person I've ever met in my life, that neither you nor the Olsen shipping company realized that in five, 10 years time, you'd be blown out of the water by containerized shipping. And in fact, the smartphone in my pocket, in all of your pockets, is only enabled by the fact that we have containerized shipping. So the simple point I want to get over is uh, something is gonna get blown out of the water in the next five or 10 years. And we're gonna have a containerized shipping moment. And then the political question is, who will benefit from that? And just very finally, um, as an imagination play, um, and you know, putting something out there for the foundation, this was the first project uh, that the Norman Foster Foundation worked on. Uh, Norman and I worked on this together. Uh, we are going to realize this in Africa. What is relevant from a robotics point of view in terms of uh, uh, this equity question is, Here's the drone port operations. Here's the community uh, bringing stuff, having postal function, and so on. Here is the home of the robot. What kind of robot exactly, we don't know. Some 3D printing, some of this partial robotics. But we do know that if we want these people to have a higher quality of life, we have to be a hell of a lot. I mean, a lot more imaginative than we have been to date. And here, I think, is where the future of the planet will be decided in a, a space like that. You know, what is the energy system? What are the spare parts? How do these people benefit? How do things move back and forward? Um, essentially, we, at the moment, we have very limited imagination, and that's probably what our debate will have to be about. So, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan's going to stay on stage for a moment while we redress it. And I thought while we have a moment, um, it might just be worth reminding ourselves of Asimov, Asimov's three laws of robots. Um, you probably know them by heart. I had to look them up. Um, the first law, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, a robot must obey orders given it by human beings, except when such orders would conflict with the first law. And then the third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or the second laws. I don't know whether those laws still survive, uh, I think this is something for us to discuss as I invite Anne and Inigo to join us on stage uh, for the debate. And in doing so, I want to... Please come, come on up. Please take a seat, Jonathan. Um, I want to start with the subject of work because I think, for me anyway, work is the big challenge and uh, discussing at the foundation earlier in the week, and Nicholas Negroponte has joined us today, 
Um, this was one of your questions, Nicholas. What, where are we all going to be working in the future, and what does work mean when so much of what we do today can be done by a machine? Um, Inigo, you're in that zone already. Where do you see us and our children and our grandchildren working in the future? Uh, I am not uh, visionary enough to, to respond to this because I don't have the skills to detect when the inflection points that I mentioned before, uh, to detect them very earlier and to see which is, uh, how I are going to, to be the technology be adopted massively. But uh, um, I am more or less convinced that uh, in the near future we need workers with uh, skills, with different skills than the new ones. When I uh, go to an industry, one of the first questions that uh, is being arise when we apply this kind of technology is the, which are the skills of the next, uh, the next generation of, of workers. Maybe just hold your microphone. It's, yes. it's not picking okay. up clearly enough. No? Do you hear me? Okay. And um, I see that in the near future, for sure, the emotional part of the, of the human is going to, to be critical. Because at the end, uh, um, in the near future, because in the, in the, the, in the long term, I, I can't see it. But uh, for sure, uh, at the end, in, in uh, daily work, everything is about people. And to produce changes in the way of work, et cetera, uh, you have to, to put the best of you in the, your emotional part, in the, your rational part, your, who you co communicate, et cetera. So, Really speaking, uh, I don't know uh, how is going to be the, 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 the next generation of workers, but I can imagine which kind of skills what we are going to need in the near future. So this is my, my short answer. The subject of, of the emotional, the idea that we might separate the, the human jobs being the emotional jobs and the non-emotional jobs being done by the robots, and I'm sure you've got a view on that. Surely, but just like to, to go back, perhaps I would like to, 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 to give you like a more like midterm uh, uh, speculation, like uh, not in the 10 next years, but perhaps the 20. I hope actually that we will not be um, entitled or that we will not be compelled actually to work, but we, have the, we will have the possibility actually to choose if we want to work or not. As we know uh, from, the, from, from the existentialist, like work is something that defines really the human, that w when you hard to have to work for a living, it's, a, it's becoming a little bit different. So it's a question I can ask actually like to you. It's a, of course, it's like depending on the degree of automation and if it, automation is uh, a concerning only repetitive activities or tasks or cognitive, and then it's a question of the emotion that comes in. But there's also the question of that, like, if technology, if a superstructure, then we have also to change infrastructure to sustain this new vision, for example, universal income, or what comes then, what make the human survive if they don't have work anymore. So it's something... I, I find it's like a really inadequate um, starting point, really. I, I think we, uh, we, we, we've got to be a little bit more... Um, how can I say in English, bare-fisted about mm -hmm. this discussion, you know? Um, the fact is we have like eight or 10 companies in the world which will get to $1 trillion value. They are digital companies who want to manifest themselves in the physical world. It's kind of like a hideous pregnancy, you know? They're, they're really, they really, you know, what is digital wants to be physical, what is physical wants to be virtual, and, and in that, uh, labor, um, you know, I worked for The Economist a long time. I'm, I'm a free market guy, but I find that I'm on the really left, almost anarchist position in this point, you know. We cannot start this robot discussion uh, just from the robot. We actually have to start it from the, and, and why? Because even this discussion about embodied robots, you know, like in the, uh, the Asimov robot. I mean, that involves, not to get too technical, though I'm sure we have some engineers in the room, you know, in the actuators. Mm -hmm. You know, to get an actuator for a shoulder joint is $20,000. But you're, you're, well, flying, well, you're flying blood yeah. with your drones from small town to village and beyond. You could be uh, flying nanotechnologies 
that might create the very embodiment that you're suggesting is if otherwise the price impossible. Point is available, you know. I mean, the drone is interesting to me in this discussion because it's a very, along with the vacuum cleaner, it's the very first uh, example of a of a cheap mass mm -hmm. delivered robot, yeah. um, and uh, uh, I, I think the um, there are early opportunities. But when we look at manufacturing and how manufacturing affects jobs, I mean, it is uh, beyond the containerized shipping example. You know, you're, you're going to see, you know, uh, and why? Because if you go to Shenzhen, you talk to the Chinese Communist Party leadership in Shenzhen, they, they, they don't want humans in their factories. It's not like Africa or India is going to get these jobs downstream. No, the capital will stay in China, and the robots will be developed in China, and your smartphone will come out of China, and there won't be any jobs downstream. So in, in, in a way, it's not this idea of robots displacing, uh, but rather that they have these uh, hot spots on the planet, and everyone else is you know, not involved. And that's my big worry. Does that make sense? It, I, mm -hmm. I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense. Um, how do you stop it from happening? Sorry? How do you stop it from happening? You know, that's a very dystopian yeah. uh, vi vi vision of the future. Yeah. Um, the more bucolic might be that the robots are doing the work and we all recline, uh, paint, compose poetry. But that's well, not... Who's going, to no, pay, who's going to pay your value in the economy? Yeah. Yeah. Who would pay you? Who's going to pay for your, your food, your old people's home? your house, your dog. You, know, you have to do something in the world which has value. So you can have caring, you can do, but we know as a society- It depends on the structure be around you. You Sorry? don't need to do something to be retributed to have something mm -hmm. for a living. It could be also organized completely differently. But you said you were working for The Economist and were like, like for, uh, well, an advocator I, I of the, that. Well, I think the minimal, uh, a minimal, minimal wage is not a proven concept, but that's not what It depends discussing. on the theories. There are economic, uh, ec economics, economic, economic scientists that think it's actually sustainable and it's possible to implement it. Well, Inigo, you're, the you're, way, actually, you Inigo, you're making money, I presume. You're an entrepreneur. That doesn't always mean you make money. I have to. I, um, <laughs> in, in, in this space. <laughs> yeah, you're making money in this space. Um, where are your children going to be working in the future? How are they going to be addressing good, this risk that Jonathan's just good, described? Good question. And when, the, when you are mentioning my kids, for example, my father, that uh, sometimes helped me in the, your microphone. Uh, in the education of my, of my children. He's telling me all the time that uh, we are using the technology in a wrong way because I am working a lot every day more and more hours and I am all the, all the time connected and something are, uh, we are using the technology in, in, in a wrong way. So uh, I am dreaming in a world that for sure we are uh, creating uh, factories in a distributed way, you not know, concentrated in, in some places because I think it's more sustainable. That for sure we are uh, using the, or, or, or our lives in a better way to, to share, the, for example, the time with, with, with families and, 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 and other uh, better things that uh, to put screws in, in, in somewhere. And for that, for sure, we have to, to make, a, to ask or, or to, to ask if we are giving the right value to tasks that, that, we, uh, that um, are performed, can be not to be so this is where I disagree with you. You're talking about the right value. I'm talking about the right price point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the right price point. If you have companies like Bosch, Universal Robots, they're out there. They want to sell $50,000 devices. Great for them. Not very good for distributing manufacturing through the economy. You know? So somehow governments or venture capitalists have to move into that space to see that collapse in the price point. You then we get to your point at that point, but we're not there at the moment because you'd have to be a Bavarian shoe manufacturer uh, with quite a bit of cash to, to invest in one of those robots. You know? uh, this is a political and international problem. Hmm. I mean, this is not, how, do you, how does the nation state respond to this challenge? 
This goes beyond the nation state. What are the international mechanisms? It's just mechanisms? an imagination play, Tim. It's just about a raw imagination. It's really, you know, we spend so much time talking about, uh, you know, android robots because we have this obsession through science fiction uh, and through the arts. Uh, and that really is confusing our view of what intelligent automation should be. Essentially, what we want is a sort of a dexterity, so our digital intelligence has some dexterity. That's all we're talking about. But a it's limb. Perhaps what you are talking about, but I don't think it's like what everybody wants. There are also like like more philosophical uh, challenges. But why, why don't you talk about sex robots? Because th that's going to no? be a massive. I mean, uh, it's one of the topics beyond other, among others. I think like it's something that we, we tackled yesterday. Yeah. Um, of course, it's an important question, and it's related actually to the rules of Asimov. First, the rules of Asimov they are invalidated because they are wardrooms that have been like uh, an automated wardrooms that are just like developed right now. So, the first law is like over. And, but of course, it's like a very interesting frame today for like ethical robotics, robotic ethics. Sorry, mm -hmm. but so. We are in the ethics, of course, speaking of sexual robots. Um, yeah, sexual robots, I think it's um, uh, an interesting point to see how they can, one, liberate or disalienate uh, people uh, like prostitutes, for example, but there's other people that are actually suffering from it. But, all, but they have to be framed, of course, in a very um, hetero, non-normative way. Yeah. So, of course, the sexual um, uh, robots shouldn't be um, suffering under like violence and I don't know like it's it's really important to see how to implement it in a very ethical way or so yeah. but of course it tackles the question of the emotion of course I can be emotional with a very basic tool if this tool I extra use the term tool, which for me is already a technical being because there is humanity residing in it because I relate to it and I'm changed from the moment I use it. So if we are relating to these tools very emotionally, of course, even more with intelligent and autonomous things, the question we have to raise is can they, beyond empathy, meaning beyond, how uh, uh, do you say, detecting, detecting of our emotions and react to that, can they actually feel? Can they have emotion? And this is something that like, perhaps appears to be a little bit like, okay, it's the artistic woman speaking about that. But I think it's a very crucial question. Yeah. Well, I question. think it raises the subject of trust. You know, the more and more that we uh, ask machines to work on our behalf, the more we entrust them to, to perform. And that, that does, for me, raise the question of where, at what line do you pass over responsibilities mm -hmm. here as we increasingly automate. As you're, in you go, your machines are talking to each other. They're not talking via a human being. They're talking to each other. How do you trust them to get it right? <laughs> yes, Reid. Um, yes, you are totally right. Um, um, I really don't have answer, but, um, but uh, something that is very clear to me is that uh, now we are in a point uh, in the humanity that we have to face ethical problems regarding robotics. It's the moment. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. Why? Because, for example, one decade ago, two decades, uh, decades ago, we are predicting some technologies that now are mature enough. Like, for example, the autonomous car that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So, for example, ethics, uh, re ethics regarding... You just hold it. Why don't yeah. you hold it just like okay. that? Sorry. That the, uh, what I mean that um, we have to face these eth ethical problems now because otherwise it's going to be too late. No, uh, as I mentioned, the, the autonomous car. So what is happening there? No, we we talk about the asymmetry of uh, rules. So that now are invalidated, as you mentioned. No, so uh, I think it's the moment we uh, we have to face this. But I think you you have to. Well, first of all, ethics is um, directly linked to law and the insurance industry. So it's terrifying when you go to robotics conferences that there are no serious lawyers in the room. I was I mean, just wondering, to big law there's firms. always a lawyer in the room. There's always, <laughs> and, and I'll be interested to hear Let's from see, you. How many lawyers do we in, have in here? In a, do we in have a, a lawyer? In they the won't put their hands up necessarily, because, um, but, but I did want to say, in a moment, 
Um, I'll ask maybe another question, or we'll see where we go for a couple of minutes. But I really want to hear. There have been a few, you know, sort of uh, nervous giggles as we've been making this discussion. I suspect that means that you want to engage. Um, we'll have some microphones going around in a moment. So please think about the questions. What's missing in the room? Who haven't we got on stage? Um, what are the issues that we've not yet covered? Uh, and apologies for cutting in on your, on your legal discussion. I'll let you carry on. Uh, no, I was just going to say, well, you know, ethics, yes. Uh, and we can, you know, because I've been working with drones the last four or five years. And previously, I was the terrorism correspondent of The Economist. So I actually saw both ends of... Um, Literally, I saw drones killing people, so blood on the ground, but now we've seen like blood deliveries in the air, so civilian use of drones. Uh, the United Nations already has um, a couple of bodies now which are actually starting to think about ethics of robots. Um, uh, but you can't talk about that without talking about artificial intelligence. That's a critical point. So the, the robot is plugged and in fact, the robot will be subsidiary to the AI, you know? It will just I'm glad be, you've raised that because... It will just be the, the, the touching points of AI in the world. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, okay. because you, you were referring to the analog uh, of the robot. Yeah. And actually, my sus suspicion is that it's the micro, it's the fine scale, it's, the, it's what we swallow, it's what we implant. It might be what we wear that is actually going to be the disruptive technological influence. And we might call it a robot or not. I'd, I'd be interested nano, to know. Nano-robots. Uh, yeah, nano, nano-robots. Um, that, I think, is a, is a vision that we, we really need to consider that has to take us beyond the Terminator cyborg, the HAL. Well, maybe HAL in 2001 is, is a good example of this. Yeah, no, I think, he, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that was an extremely uh, prescient film in that okay. sense. Uh, but I, I, I think that the more we veer towards law and price points, it seems a bit boring, but the more we veer towards law and price points and governance, um, uh, the more uh, imaginative uh, and equitable our future will be. Uh, the more we veer weirdly towards imagination, I, science fiction, uh, the more problematic it becomes. Because you see the gap between this embodied, embodied science fiction yeah. robot. But the embodied science fiction robot that you are mentioning is the one of Shapek. But there are a lot of different kind of embodiment. And embodied things in a thing with a body can be something that is not anthropomorphic at all. What I wanted to say actually with the embodiment is the idea that you don't have like production of knowledge, you don't have existence without a body. Even if this body is dispersed, even if this body is fluid, is like super nano, micro, I don't know. So it's no, not about the body, anthropomorphic. The body, the body a... helps you just like to have a situated knowledge. A si a si I mean, a something that you, where you say, okay, what I say, what I think, it's not universal. Mm -hmm. It's at the moment. So it brings you relativity and like it forces you to go actually beyond the idea that, okay, the man entitled with his universal and non embodied rationality is dominating everything else, you know? So it's not about like having this science fiction of like you always do that, like it's not about this body of like this disarticulated robots, you know? And I think science fiction can offer actually imaginary models, but also models of implementation of technology that are far beyond the idea that you have of it actually. It can, and, and there are a lot also of situations historically, as you will better know than myself, where science fiction actually precedes the technological, but sometimes also precedes some ethical Sometimes it does, as but, uh, but in this case it has not, and I don't believe it will, and I think okay. it's unhelpful. Well, let's take an, audi an audience view. The, the real challenge under these circumstances is who will be prepared to ask the first question. I'm so pleased we have a volunteer, <laughs> Lord, Lord Foster. Can I um, <coughs> kind of set the scene? Uh, we heard that half of the week, two and a half days, has been uh, uh, the group of 10 graduates in three teams working with clay, sand, and earth, and moving it around, manipulating it, creating extraordinary magic out of it. The other two and a half days has been key individuals 
sharing their knowledge with all of us and then engaging in a debate. So when one mentor, who's a historian, distinguished art critic, said, robotics, artificial intelligence, is going to transform labor, we all immediately think of a building site and the clay, the sand, the earth, and that's going to transform the way that we make buildings. Ah, oh, no, says this person. No, 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 I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking of you, the designer. So suddenly, we're faced with the prospect that I'm out of work. <laughs> I don't have a job. And Fabio, at that point, says something like, I don't get it. I mean, how could robots do what Norman and his colleagues did, which was reinvent the airport, kind of turn it upside down. Um, and then that led to somebody saying, tell us a little about how that happened. And I said something like, well, imagine a round table. And um, there's an architect, there's an engineer, there's a quantity surveyor, and they're all pooling their knowledge. And out of this comes the realization that you can totally redesign, reinvent, turn it upside down. And then the prospect is, could robots do that? Could you have a round table with a robot with one skill? With it? Could robots reflect? It was a conversation that Nicholas and I had. I'd love to hear how the panel feels about that, and particularly you, Jonathan. So, so no, no, oh, no pressure. Oh, by the way, there's one wonderful prospect. When the roof leaks, it's the robot's fault. <laughs> the lawyers will have a field day. Um, Can yeah. I suggest something? Your, your slide, the yeah. centralized, the decentralized, the networked, mm. I think is, re is relevant to this. When you, because I, I'd like to think the robot might be able to think of turning a, and then we all, we're all out of work, genuinely. When you distribute the robots in a grid and let them talk to each other and let them reflect and have that reflective uh, yeah, yeah. response. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, when the, um, that was the point I was mm. making that uh, we have to be careful. I mean, we, we can choose to say robot subsumes AI and machine intelligence and systems network. Um, if, if we assume that, then absolutely the weird thing that can happen is that, uh, sure, that very bright humans um, can come up with extraordinary creative solutions. But your machine intelligence is going to ask 67,000 questions. Um, uh, 66,900 uh, 6, of those will not be relevant. <laughs> but because it interrogates the task so persistently at, at, at such high speed and from directions that humans simply would not think of connecting, um, that you will get these highly optimized solutions. Uh, and when you combine that with what we already saw in the, the workshop, which is the, the possibility of precise manipulation of materials um, at low cost, uh, then, then it is very interesting. But I, I don't see the emotional um, capacity. I don't, I don't think you're going to be unemployed yet, Norman. <laughs> you know? Um, would, would anyone else like to go? I, I'm struck. Yes, we have a hand up uh, just behind. If you kindly pass the microphone back, and I am looking to both sides as well. So, shout if I if I don't see you first time. We have the next question up there. Great, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna somewhat circle back to the anthropomorphism conversation. Um, and somewhat building on and your presentation. Um, my, I'm curious about how um, the technology and what is the role of technology, including robotics, um, in the context of our current gender situation. 
Um, and of course, that is a very multifaceted question, starting with women in tech and women in robotics. But what I'm more interested in is how the interactions that we today design with our machines influence the, our relationships within our society. Um, I personally find it incredibly tragic that as somebody who is inheriting Donna Haraway's cyborg manifesto and her encouragement to use the technology for the sake of feminism, we end up designing machines such as Siri and Alexa, who are very clearly you know, female servants that are just performing any function we ask them to perform. Um, so my question is, can we design different modes of interaction that would actually make us better humans and help us get rid of those biases that are so embedded in our society? Thank you. Oh, I think you, thank you for this question. Um, it's of course super difficult to answer and I cannot answer it. But um, there are a lot of artists and theoreticians that have tackled this question. I'm sure that it's possible to design indeed um, uh, avatar or uh, objects or machines, but first we have indeed to go much farther than we are from anthropocentrism. Because from the moment, speaking again from sexual machines and for like imagining actually sexual machine or machine with a very intimate inter interrelation, interrelation that would actually go beyond normative ways, normative ways to think and to live sexuality. Then of course, when you have a robot that looks like that have perfect menstruations with, uh, okay, I don't say the perfect menstruation, I don't know them. Uh, it, of course, you have like all the sedimented layers of your predetermination, cultural and social predetermination that plays. But if you go beyond that, and this is what Sitze Meineke Hansen, the artist I just uh, quoted before, suggests, it's like you have like different kind of, uh, uh, of other um, embodiments of machines and you have no models to act with them, so you have to imagine from a tabula rasa. And I think this is one, for example, uh, possible uh, uh, solution. Okay, we'll take a pair of questions. We've got one mic ready there, and after your question, sir, we've got another one back here. So thank you so much for this conversation. My question relates to some extent to the question that was just asked, which is the concept of humanizing technology and technology humanizing ourselves. And I think when we talk about sex robots, maybe uh, the main function that these robots will do will not be sexual, but related to empathy and to solve the problem of solitude. And I think that brings another understanding to this whole concept of this uh, whole conversation, which is uh, in some way I have the, the, the feeling that the whole conversation is framed around the assumption that the concept of human and the concept of robots are stable and will be uh, separate uh, forever. And I think we could challenge that concept. I mean, as we uh, augment our bodies and our senses and our functions with technology, uh, when do we stop being humans and when do we become uh, robots? Uh, and does it make sense to start talking about degre degrees of robotness or anything alike? And maybe this prism will bring a completely different understanding uh, to, this, uh, to this conversation. Thank you. More of a, a comment than a question. Let's just hold it and take a, another contribution. So I wanted to ask if, um, as technology progresses, it would be possible that uh, there's some level of independence that, for example, a uh, military drone gets the order to shoot against a target, but questions the order and asks itself, why should I shoot this thing? Or, there, or one people or one person's room by just saying, why I'm just cleaning this guy is dirt. It will be also possible that e this th that these robots could even have some creativity that they could even write a book, but not just um, hundreds of words, but something with an actual emotion. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, I, I think again we're getting back to Norman's point about uh, what what is a robot um, and what is the intelligence embedded within the, the robot. Um, I think we're already seeing, and this is where uh, there is a field of artificial intelligence, which you probably know, uh, which is optimization and game theory. So lots of really weird things can start to happen. Uh, I mean, a very simple example is you know, optimizing traffic on a motorway. So uh, just 
if you have autonomous cars, suddenly they're able to optimize speed. With drones, we already have shown um, in, in my lab in Switzerland, uh, one of the PhD students went out to the uh, rugby field and he threw up um, 20 drones into the sky um, and, and, and they were about 50 meters apart from each other uh, and then he had them fly at full speed to the same central point. So they were all in a circle and they all fly. So in real time, they have to talk to each other and, and find their pathways. So we're going to see really, really radical uh, network effects in, in that way. I think emotion is a much longer and uh, different uh, discussion. I think we're just at the beginning of that. Um, and on the previous question, when do we stop being human? I think we already stopped, and this is what I tried actually to explain in the, in the, in the keynote. Actually, it was the base of the, of the keynote, so I, I, I hope I, I, I kind of succeeded in, in saying that. I think we are not human anymore. We are already post-human. And we were perhaps already post-human a long time ago, like pre previous the time, prior to the time we just seemed to um, have uh, welcomed technology in the, in the society, I think. Okay, um, in you go. Yes, so when you, when you are speaking about the, if the, the robot is an extension of us, um, and uh, I remember that you, you were speaking of the 2001 and Space Odyssey now where you can see the uh, invention of the tool and how the tool is, uh, has an evolutionary, uh, it has an evolution and, and, and artificial and, uh, intelligence that superpass the human, no? This is at the end the conclusion of the, of the film from my point of view. So um, the thing is that these kind of questions at the end uh, um, hide and, uh, that we are afraid that, the, that our tool is going to superpass us. And there is this, this uh, is, or is a, really an extension of us, also it's something separated and go, so we are going more or less to disappear, no? This is the, the, the real the question behind, no? about the creativity and, 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 and robots. So and now the state of the art uh, has created systems that uh, has semantic aspects of the information that uh, they received. So they, have, they, they can understand with, with the, the data that they are uh, reading or receiving. So, uh, and there are a lot of work, for example, um, analyzing music, uh, which uh, pattern and melodies are the most uh, successful uh, regarding uh, um, human feelings. So we are on the way. So I, I don't know. I um, I don't know which is the 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 the, the goal or, or the state of the art in the next years. But uh, creativity and and, and 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 robotics are still there. So. We've got um, always time against us, and now all the hands are going up. Um, can I ask 30 seconds and no more of super question or comment, and we'll, go, we'll do one, two, three, four, and then 30 seconds of fantastic response. <laughs> yeah, so, and then, and then we'll, we'll throw the microphones around, please. Okay, so quickly, um, from the perspective of designing this product of our imagination, which is basically what robotics will be, it's not a product of nature, it's ours, um, to make sure that lo their logic doesn't say, okay, you all, all of us, are bald, and we should destroy you, therefore. Um, I think education is an important part of um, our educational system to not start structuring our minds from day one, as we do, especially, I mean, here partic particularly, and not, not just Spain, but I mean, from my point of view, I can say so, because uh, I grew up here, but um, to have the ambition, the creativity, the perseverance to take these tools, create emotions, create new tools, instead of just trying to follow the norm and move a little bit out of the stream of, of the box, how, how, can we, how can we create robots, which from the, the initial point, because they learn from us, have that ethical point of view that many of us are probably very lucky to have that other people don't. So that even when they learn from the most horrible aspects of humanity, they still go back to cohabitation with us instead of our illumination. Thank you, thank you. Um, we'll go over here because the mic is ready. Listen, thank you. Okay. Um, 
actually, my question is also a little bit similar, uh, uh, but because it's about education. Uh, you're talking about the philosophy and the political aspects of emergence of the robots, but I think there is this point that is always missing that how important robot can be in educational technologies. And I think while adults are sitting here and talking about the fear of emergence of the technology that are robots and they will come in our life at some point, we forget to monitor how children are interacting with them, how we can use them to teach them and how probably the way children accept robots and interact with them can be a define how they will uh, come into our life in the future. And we are forgetting that fact that exists there. We are sitting here and they are interacting, but we are not thinking about it. And that's probably missing a lot. And I personally work in education and I see a lot of teachers being afraid, but at the same time, a lot of them being really open about it. But we are not really putting uh, our economical, political po attention into this fact, and I'm interested to know your opinion about Thank it. Thank you so much. We'll take one, one last comment, sir. Yeah, I, I was wondering about, uh, well, Nicholas Negroponte is here, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to maybe ask him what is the, the cutting edge uh, uh, going on in machine learning. He'll be all over you as you walk out, so don't worry about that. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about, um, you know, Google employees demonstrating uh, against their uh, management to basically stop this. Uh, I think the, the, the capital structures that we have today, the geopolitical structures, the institutions that we have today are obsolete. So they need to evolve at the same pace. And I think until we create a new WTO or a new political uh, uh, kind of environment that allows these institutions to adapt to these realities, uh, we're always gonna be lagging behind. So I'd like to hear from Nicholas, thanks. This is, cr this is crowd, crowdsourced, please, Nicholas, yeah. Well, I, um, I'll make two quick comments. Uh, one is I think we are living in a period of such dominance by concepts like shareholder value and things which are really inane and are gonna slowly disappear. Uh, we have been telling our children for so many years to go into the corporate commercial world, you end up with Trump-like situations because only the losers go into the public sector. But you also have something else happening and that is, Jonathan, I don't agree with you about uh, things like universal income. I think those are very important, big, big changes. And I would remind people that work is a relatively new concept. And that if you go back just a couple of hundred years, you will find that many people didn't work. They listened to music, they, they read and wrote poetry, they, they did certain. Now that was the so-called 1% then. And what we've done is we have made that 1% into such, let's say 10% today. And in fact, nobody on stage probably thinks they work. You don't really go to work. You don't really have a boss. You kind of do what you love, and some sucker pays for it. But it's not, it's not work in the, in the tradition that when we think of people who don't have work, maybe we should give them work. And I would look more at redefining work and thinking of a future where people did the sorts of things we get to do, and how could you create an economy and a technology and a synthesis between people and machines that allow that? Thank you very much. Uh, we have a chance for a final comment and reflection on what you've just heard from each of the panel members. Perhaps just the education, I thank you for your question very much. I think it's the relation between uh, uh, children and machines is of course super important even if we didn't tackle it, but not only for educational purpose and for the future, but also because it might be interesting, but this is also a question I ask uh, actually both of you as, a, as the experts, is like um, the way actually children highly emotively react to machines uh, is very interesting perhaps to kind of like draw some parallels, how actually the cognitive development actually um, is based on also the emotion. The emotion as actually a way to put together uh, dispersed information, for example, or to rely to memory, et cetera. And perhaps this is also a key, I don't know, ask you actually, a key thing on, 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 on 
to research on for the evolution of the cognitive capabilities of uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence. I don't know. Okay, um, as a last comment, conclusion, so I'm regarding the question about the state of the art of the cutting edge uh, uh, algorithms uh, for machine learning. So I think that the next step uh, is going to be that, uh, okay, now the machine can learn, they extract knowledge, but they don't, want to, they don't know how to share it or how to explain uh, what they, are, they learned to us. No? So this is, it, they, it, the knowledge remains in a black box. So, for example, you look to deep learning algorithms, that is evolution of the neural networks and works very well because you put in the machine training data, you, it can be wrong data and reacts very well. Mm. But you can't ask to, to the machine, okay, which rule have you learned and tell us in, in a comprehensive way and uh, with words what happened there, no? Uh, this is the next step for me. And this is a huge uh, challenge, a technical challenge. John. <laughs> um, sorry. I was lost in thought. Um, Nick, I, I only, um, we're friends, so I can be rude to you. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I only very partially agree with uh, your point. Um, of course, we want to move to a point where uh, people live lives and they receive value simply on account of them being alive on the planet and having their own body. Uh, the reality is that there's not enough money even to build a road in many parts of the planet. There's simply not enough cash in our economy at the moment. And if I was to take you with me to some of uh, you know, informal settlements in Nigeria and meet young men who've never had a job, they're not going to have a job. They're, they're not going to have even a pension or even any prospect of that. I think the, um, the starting point of ro robotics and machine intelligence is one, understand we are in a convergent moment so everything is crashing together at the same time. We haven't even talked about climate change and extermination of other species from our planet. This is happening concurrently with a human demographic um, and the, the, these technologies are meshing and, uh, and converging at the same time. So the, uh, your point about our politics being uh, not fit for purpose is absolutely spot on. Now, how we go out of the theatre here and address that mm. Mm. is complicated. In Britain, we just have to start with Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, again, it's impossible to, to do anything without that word coming up, but at least it came up at the end. Yeah, I got it. Um, I had to get it in once. <laughs> Look, the, um, I mean, what's clear to me that in, in wrapping up, because we, we, we have to draw things sadly to a close, is this conversation simply needs to go on. We need to find more ways, more opportunities to explore those dimensions that we, we just haven't covered. Um, let, me try to, let me try to summarize. Um, we, we have heard about the political dimension, uh, to a degree the economic dimension, and the governmental dimension. There's a legal dimension to this, which is also an ethical dimension. Um, we didn't really touch on the environment, on energy, I, I was wanting to ask. Um, and then there's a social and an emotional dimension. Um, if I've missed something out, then let's follow this up on social media afterwards. Uh, and maybe there are three kinds of robots I'd like to suggest. Uh, and I'll be told afterwards there are six. But let me try three. There's the robot of repetitive tasks that's going to uh, end many kinds of manual jobs that are part of traditional industries. There's the robot, number two, of superhuman activity, doing jobs that humans can't do. They're in outer space. They're in the deep oceans. They are requiring such a precision that they're beyond human capability. And then maybe the third type is, is the robot of, I've written here, provocative imagination. And its, its sole job is to enhance our existence and... That might, also, that might be a design robot, but it might also be an existence or a life support robot, a companion robot. 
um, the kind of robot that might, as someone mentioned, just pro provide care. We didn't really touch on care enough today, I don't think. Um, that, for me, is the most intriguing, but it may be the least disruptive. It may be the first dull and boring kind of robot that is the most disruptive. Um, so let's continue these, these discussions as we move forward. Uh, let me draw with some, some thanks. I, I, I may have got it wrong and said the Rolex Foundation earlier. My apologies. It's the Rolex Institute, of course. But by the time this film is broadcast, I'll have been replaced with artificial intelligence that puts the right word in my mouth at the time. Um, thanks to, uh, to Lord and Lady Foster and to the trustees of the Norman Foster Foundation uh, for intellectually stimulating uh, these possibilities, this series of events that will continue to roll and to roll. Thank you to my panel members, uh, to the scholars, to the professors, to the mentor, Fabio, in particular. I know uh, Nicholas may say it doesn't feel like work, but boy, it's work, um, <laughs> leading one of these week-long workshops. Um, and thank you all for coming, being part of this online, on land, with your questions and provocations. Um, thank you all. We're going to do a photograph, uh, Norman and uh, Fabio, if you would just join us on stage. You can all get your cameras out. This is where you get the chance to record this, this moment. Uh, let's all stand up. And, uh... Thanks so much. It's nice to have you here. Okay. Good. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Go home safely. Next time, I'll remember to do that.